Good morning, everyone. This is Leah Oyman here. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking some time off your busy schedules to attend our session today. Um, this session was organized by Hannah Cameron at Capco Scotland. So thank you, Hannah. Um, we will have um, the presentation um, run by Chris Shields and Sarah O'Callaghan, also at Capco Scotland. And what we'll be covering is basically um, what, we're, what we're looking to do with our workforce, um, taking that we're all in this um, unexpected, amazing situation right now uh, following COVID-19. Um, we see ourselves in, a, in an environment where we're all probably working from home most of the time right now, um, which presents some challenges. But we also see some opportunities for the longer term around talent, um, around employee engagement and productivity. So we'll be covering what well, Sarah and Chris will be covering some of that uh, during the next slides. So without further ado, I'll pass on to Sarah for a bit of an introduction on herself and then Chris will introduce him introduce himself um, and then they'll give a bit of a, a summary around what Capco do before they then move on to the slides. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Leah. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sarah O'Callaghan, a principal consultant at Capco and part of the digital leadership team at Capco UK. I've been with Capco for six years now in London with my time spent working in digital and more recently <clears throat> moved to Scotland where I'm leading digital and I'm heavily involved in Capco's COVID-19 digital propositions. Prior to Capco I worked in technology for the Financial Times for four years and was part of the team that launched FT.com. So over to you Chris for an intro. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Leah, for the introduction. And again, thank you, everyone, for giving up your time today and giving us the opportunity to speak to you about Workforce of the Future, something that will certainly impact all of us in, in the coming months and years. I'm Chris Shields. I've worked in financial services transformation for over 20 years across a number of companies in Scotland. And the last four and a half of those years have been at Capco, where I'm a part of the, the Scottish leadership team. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Capco are a, a global consultancy firm. We have 27 offices and 5,000 employees worldwide. Our single focus is on financial services and the issues that impact our industry in this ever-changing world in which we live. One of our strengths is that global footprint, but equally important is our local knowledge. We've had a presence in Scotland for almost five years, and during that time we've seen a huge amount of growth. When I joined in late 2015, we had around 30 consultants, and now that number is nudging 140. This is complemented by around 1,000 additional consultants in London, and it gives us a really strong UK capability across the breadth of financial services and across a number of different disciplines. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, um, and enough of the introductions, probably I'm sure you're keen to get into the, the material, so let me hand you back to Sarah, who will tell you a little bit more about what we're going to cover. Thanks, Chris. Um, so before we get into the content, I wanted to set the scene and provide a little context. So when COVID-19 hit back in March, um, we mobilised a team to respond to the challenges faced by and our clients during the pandemic. We created some propositions and produced some thought leadership across various themes. The topic of today's webinar is the workforce of the future, which is centred around our latest proposition called the future of work and working from anywhere. It's an evolution of two of our previous propositions called embracing new ways of working and workforce reintegration. Both were created, I guess, a couple of months back at the start of the pandemic, and they were focused more on the overnight shift to remote working. Our thinking has evolved since then. And you know, there's a real need to focus on the human element and the people side of things. So the pandemic has been an unexpected catalyst for remote working. Prior to COVID, um, there was a business case for working from home already in place. The statistics showed a real demand from employees, um, particularly when it comes to job satisfaction and work-life balance. And it was becoming a real consideration for people when deciding to take a new job. Flexibility was really paramount. A small number of mature, digitally mature businesses were already set up and were operating in this way, and I guess had very little disruption when COVID hit. 
most companies had to who had this in their long term strategic strategy over two to five years, they managed to shift overnight or within two weeks to remote working. So for most companies, there was a sense of maybe treading water to ensure BAU could still run. But now, as we hopefully begin to move past lockdown, companies are beginning to plan for the medium and long term. As I said, the pandemic has presented a real opportunity for companies to reimagine what the future of work looks like. So it's not just limited to the technologies that enable remote working. It's about how we work, the behaviours we instill and the culture that we put in place. How do we team? And of course, as I said, the tools that the company have used to enable all of this. So moving on um, to the next, the next piece. It's clear that the future of work will not be the same and companies need to rethink the workforce of the future. How can we reimagine the art of the possible? We've created a range of solutions um, in our toolkit where we can bring different offerings and solutions to help clients across these four pillars you see on the screen. We have ways of working on people and also physical space and technology. Today, we'll focus mostly on people and ways of working due to the time we have. Um, but we will touch on physical space and technology too. They're all very closely linked and need to be considered holistically across the four pillars in order to really get the future of work right. So ways of working is really about remote effectiveness and better ways of working. How do we make it better for all? We've done a great job thus far, but we did have to adapt very quickly. There, as I said, there was a sense of treading water and people getting used to it. But people do miss being able to chat with their colleagues in person. And the use of collaborative software has been great during the period, but there are definitely habits that we need to break and things that we can build upon. Employee well-being is really at the heart of all of this because remote working works for some, but not for all. It's like Marmite. Some people love it. Some people hate it. It is also really about people. The employee experience and the employee value proposition is at the heart and centre of everything. Employee well-being now is even more key. We feel that employee choice is really critical and it's a key criteria in terms of how the future ways of working will shape. The physical space is more about the office space, but is also about location strategy. There's an article in the most recent um, Economist called Post-Pandemic Cities. And it talks about significant movement of people out of big cities such as London, Paris and New York. So there's an opportunity to cut down costs and reimagine the real estate strategy here. Finally, technology is about the tools we use, the improvements we can make with productivity in mind, and then thinking beyond to tomorrow's technology. It's more about automation and emerging tech. COVID-19 has really changed the way that we work, and it's clear that things won't go back to normal. PAPCO have identified three distinct phases whereby we can transition and create the future of work. This can't be done overnight, though, and we recognise that. Instead, a phased approach towards a holistic model aligned to the wider business strategy is really needed. The first phase, effectiveness today is what we saw organisations go through over the past few months. It's a tactical response, and this phase is all but complete. The second phase, um, shift and adjust, it's incremental shifts, but with a real eye on the future. And this is where most organisations are right now. And then the final phase is tomorrow's workforce, reimagining what the future of, of work looks like. With these three phases in mind, we'll now talk through the four elements of the future of work. So I'll hand over to Chris to take you through people. So what do we mean, who do we mean by people? Well, it's all of us. It's our colleagues, it's our customers, our suppliers, our business partners, and by extension, our own family and friends. What we all have in common is our own individuality and our feelings on the COVID-19 crisis and how it's impacted us psychologically. And that psychological element can't be underestimated. We all have different personal circumstances, and many people like me are perhaps enjoying the extra hour in bed in the morning or enjoying spending more time with your family in the evening. Other people will be really keen to get back to work and the social contact that that provides. Some people will fit between those two camps, keen to get back into the office, but perhaps apprehensive about the risk of disease either for themselves or for a vulnerable relative. 
So throughout this period, communication is vital. And I want to stress here, it's not just about cascading corporate policy to your employees, it's about listening to your employees and what their expectations are. A recent survey shows that 59% of people do expect their employer's approach to flexible working to change post-COVID. And we need to understand what employer means. It's not just the corporate face of an organisation. It's the people's immediate line manager. It's their function head. It's their colleagues. It's everyone they come face to face with on a day-to-day -day basis. In the short term, it's perhaps not even practical for many people to come back to the office, even if they wanted to. Um, we know that public transport is going to be beyond below normal capacity. People are going to have to wear masks. And again, that's perhaps something people aren't keen to do. So what incentives could be offered for other modes of transport? Perhaps an increased focus on cycle schemes, access to parkings. If our buildings are going to be below capacity, then perhaps our car parks will be too. What we shouldn't be expecting people to do is to fill in the extra hours that they would normally commute by doing more work. An article in The Economist recently said that the average working day in the UK and in other parts of Europe had increased by two hours since the COVID-19 restrictions began. In the US, that's up to three hours. It's not appropriate to expect people to work more. And from a legal and an HR perspective, it's very important that we make sure we're treating our teams appropriately. Another example would be, is it okay to ask a reluctant colleague who doesn't want to return to work about their medical history, or perhaps the medical history of a partner or child? These are sensitive issues, and we need to find the right way to deal with them sensitively. So what about the workforce and how that will evolve going forward? So, apologies. Um, William Hague wrote in The Telegraph last week, he's, he compared the lockdown to the Dunkirk evacuation in World War II. He described it as a heroic operation in itself, but the result of a massive failure. With health experts in the UK warning only today of a second wave, we need to make sure that that's not an accusation that can be levied against our own business. What about our business continuity plans? Were they adequate? You saw many companies were rushing out to buy laptops for everyone and install VC technology, but others, the shift to 100% working from home went relatively seamless. We need to think about where our skill sets are across the globe. Unfortunately, in the press recently, we were hearing stories from India and from Delhi in particular that the hospitals there are struggling to cope with the volume of COVID-19 patients, whilst at the same time, the authorities are reluctant to increase the lockdown restrictions. Does this affect our offshoring model? Should we be considering it in the context of perhaps more nearshoring or onshoring model? It's certainly something that we need to think about. In a minute or two, Sarah is going to talk us through the, the challenges and opportunities of a new way of working. But what's obvious is that we're probably going to have to upskill immediately our team in this new world that we live in. Um, and perhaps we're going to have to have lots of training and training in a different way. We also shouldn't assume that going forward, people will be able to work from home whenever they want to. Careful consideration needs to be given about how your organisation can work more effectively and find that right balance. Video conferencing is great. But at the end of the day, it's only a simulation of that human-to-human -human contact that, that Sarah touched on a minute ago. We need to find the right blend of office and home working. And we'll speak a little bit more about the technology options later on. We need to look at the benefit packages. Are they best suited to your workforce working from home? What about health and safety? Should you have work, assessment, work, work station assessments at home? Could someone potentially sue you, sue you because they've burnt themselves making a cup of tea in their own kitchen? I mean, it might, it might sound fanciful, but it, these things are realistic possibilities that we have to look at. Your new operating model may require skill sets that you don't currently have, and you need to hire in. So let's explore in a bit more detail how your talent strategy will look going forward. You may have all heard of post-traumatic stress, but an article by Adam Grant, who is a renowned US-based psychologist, recently spoke about post-traumatic growth. And what he meant by this was that people who have shared the traumatic experience come out the end of that more closely bonded, more capable of working together efficiently. And he said that companies who have treated their employees well in this difficult period will reap the benefits of it later on. They will have grateful employees. They will be able to maintain and retain talent. They will be able to attract new talent to their organisation. Conversely, companies who are perceived to treat their employees badly may struggle to retain talent, and they may struggle to attract new people to their organisation. This is an important factor in your search for talent, and, and it may impact your own organisation. So it's very important to have an increased focus on employee well-being, the understanding of individual roles, um, of job design, and of course of psychology. 
consider aligning your expectation framework with a new norm, build out outcomes, outcomes around softer skills. I mean, I'm only being half flippant when I say, you know, it could be an outcome to find out more about a colleague, the name of their pet child, favourite type of colour. Curry, uh, mine is Rogan Josh, if, if anyone is interested. You need to think about the leadership style in your company. Micromanagement is unproductive at the best of times, but it becomes almost impossible in the context of remote working. Think about the why of your organisation. Encourage servant leadership, where you put the needs of other people first, empowering, enabling them, and getting them all to deliver towards your company's vision. If you're hiring new employees, consider how you maximise your ability to tap into talent pools, and how your new organisational design may impact this. Take gender balance as an example. Um, a UK government statistic from 2019, so it was relatively recently, showed that almost three out of ten mothers with a child under age 14 had said they would reduced their working hours because of childcare reasons. This compares to one in 20 for fathers. If your organisation adapts a more flexible way of working, how can this allow you not only to address perhaps a gender imbalance that you have, but attract the very best talent to work in your company? Speaking of ways of working and flexibility, I'd like to hand you back to Sarah now, who's going to go into a bit more detail on that topic. Thanks, Chris. So I guess the, the immediate changes that we saw to, raise, to ways of working were focused around remote effectiveness and embedding them to ensure effectiveness across the team. But it's not just about that, and we have some building blocks across each area of the ways of working that are key. So lead, leadership and culture. Core values need to be reinforced from the top, as Chris said, empowering and enabling your teams by providing a shared vision, autonomy and accountability. The tools that we use um, are quite paramount now. We've all used video conferencing for the past few, few months. Tools such as Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Blue Jeans have really helped with face-to-face -face interactions. But I think a lot of people are now fatiguing. So companies need to think about other collaboration tools such as Trello and Mural and work share visualization boards to help with that. Embedding agile principles where possible um, will help with creating smaller and focused teams, so smaller teams of six to eight to increase efficiency and output. Even if not adopting the full methodology, look to embrace the behaviors around agile or clear accountability in terms of sprint cycles. Remote rituals are very important. Agreeing new remote rituals as a team, considering your adjusted team working model. Start with strong working agreements and principles in place. For example, if one person is remote, then holding the meeting remotely must happen. Previously, if somebody was working from home, that person, I guess, would dial in and you wouldn't have that human element as we now see. Um, finally, on, on um, this piece is the communication and collaboration. Um, obviously, this is key, but commit to shorter, shorter, more frequent meetings. Having things like daily stand-ups are critical. It helps with engagement. You know, if you haven't heard from somebody in a day, it doesn't necessarily mean that all is okay. So, from a well-being perspective, it also helps. Using video conferencing to create trust and intimacy with your teams. And having a plan for formal and informal communication. As I said before, people really miss that. The human, um, I guess, um, beside the coffee machine chat or, you know, in the kitchen chat that we just don't get anymore. So really ensure that you, you have that planned virtually. In terms of ways of working shifts, um, this is really where the, the agile mindset needs to be introduced. So in the next phase on the next slide, you'll see introducing expansion way, um, agile ways of working. For example, Agile elements will have been introduced to ensure remote effectiveness now, but it will be critical to introduce the frameworks more widely within the organization to really ensure that top-down approach to Agile. Aligning ways of working to human changes. So once the human organizational changes are finalized in terms of working patterns and hybrid work model, the longer term ways of working must be adjusted accordingly, updating your culture, your behaviors, your tooling, and leadership to really reflect the new split of work. As I mentioned earlier, the pandemic has really called for an evolution of leadership. It has a way of revealing, course correcting, and recalibrating what leadership really means. The organizations that will be best equipped to adapt to business beyond lockdown are those with the best leadership traits at the helm. 
But what does that modern leader look like and how will they navigate the return of normal? Train, train, train. So as Chris mentioned and as I'm reiterating, training is paramount in this new way. And as we, we change the way that we work, team coaching to reinforce behaviours and advancing the change journey, one-to-one -one coaching for top of execs is really important to help with driving this new way of leadership. But it's also essential. The leadership team now must be ways of working and agile advocates. Tooling strategy, um, ensuring your tooling strategy fully supports these ways of working, and Chris will talk to that in more detail shortly. Finally, the last piece is around a better way of working. So, as I said previously, ways of working goes far beyond tooling and technology and really represents a cultural and behavioural shift. We've heard many employees and even CEOs most recently um, in the news saying they'd be happy to go back to work if everyone was going back, but it makes no real sense if, you know, I'm one in four people and they may as well stay at home. So this shows that remote working now needs to be a standard option for all. Video because calls have become the norm, particularly for distributed and global teams. And the value of face-to-face -face and in-person meetings have become even more valuable and focused on that personal connection and team building. This creates efficiencies by ensuring face-to-face -face is now valued and the concept of talking shop and having no agenda for your meeting, that really needs to go. These meetings are even more crucial than ever, so they really need to be focused. And how do we ensure these face-to-face -face meetings um, are effective? We can create work bubbles like we, we see for the return to school. Um, we, can reach, we can create work bu bubbles. A team can act as a bubble and go back to the office one day and another team on a different. It works from a health and safety perspective, but also for the well-being and the team cohesiveness. Flexible job redesign. So smart organizations will redesign jobs in conjunction with employees and retrain their staff, give greater flexibility in times of stress. And productivity, the focus should shift to outcome-based measures over inputs. And the always online mentality of before needs to go. New ways of working provides an opportunity to create highly productive teams, increasing productivity against the pre-COVID levels. So things like advanced workplace data analytics techniques can be used to model productivity. Finally, empowered teams. Organizations need to find the balance between what worked before and what needs to happen to succeed in the new normal. If teams are brought into that vision and ways of working and they feel trusted and empowered, they will deliver. They will be more productive and you'll have a much happier and well-rounded workforce. Now over to Chris to talk about technology. Thank you, Sarah. So technology. If you're like me, you like something for free. And, and right now, technology companies are falling over themselves to give you something for free. They're keen to encourage you to build your new infrastructure and your new organisational design around their platforms. And it's something you should really consider taking advantage of. Try a few out. You'll find which one works best for you. There's lots of options. I'm sure I touched on some of them there. We're using BlueJeans today. You may have used Zoom, Zoom Microsoft Teams in, in your own office. You may use WhatsApp with friends, Mural, etc. There's lots of things to consider, but, but please don't rush it. You know, carefully consider what's right for you. Carefully consider the security implementations and the concerns. We saw at the very start of the COVID-19 crisis, Boris Johnson was accused of giving away the cabinet's Zoom password as he demonstrated to the media how kind of tech savvy they were having their, their virtual cabinet meetings. Make sure the teams know which platforms to use for which purposes and, and how to use them effectively, what they're good for and what their shortcomings are. Make sure they know when to switch the camera off. Consider having advocates of each system embedded throughout your organisation, people who can be turned to by colleagues for advice and, and tips on how to use these tools, um, and make sure that everyone knows if what the recommended platforms are change. There's nothing worse than everyone else using Zoom and you're on MS Teams or the other way around. So the immediate tooling needs are, are very important and, and something that I'm sure you're all looking at, but what about going forward? How do we improve technology? So you're up and running, you're having your Zoom meetings or your MS team meetings and everything is working fine, or, or is it? And even if it is working fine, can it be better? We spoke earlier about organisational design and the technology we use to support this is going to be very important. Look at how you measure and communicate your productivity. 
what technology will support your new focus on the why, and in the expectation framework and servant leadership, which is connected to this. Which companies will you partner with, and how will the technology help in your end-to-end -end business offering? Automation is something you may be familiar with in your own organisation. It's certainly used widely in financial services, but it's probably not used as efficiently or certainly as scale that it could be used for. So think about that as we return to the office. What quick wins are available to your organisation through automation? Smart technology. Um, I am lucky enough, if, if that's the right word, to be the chair of my local parent council at my son's primary school, and I know that smart boards are used in primary school classes throughout the country, but we don't really see many in offices. You know, smart boards are a great way of bridging that gap between people in the office and, and people in the home environment. And there are other similar tools out there. You know, consider these as you plan for the medium term, how you can make that collaboration that's going to be essential more efficient. That's in the kind of short term, but what about the longer term view of technology? How will this change as we move into the coming months and years? I'm probably showing my age now when I say I remember a film called The Lawnmower Man, um, which was released in 1993, and it promised a scary world of virtual reality was just around the corner. Almost 30 years ago now, and things perhaps haven't developed in the way that some people predicted, but the opportunities that it presents are nonetheless very exciting. Imagine sitting in a room, not on Zoom, but in a virtual office next to your colleagues, getting up, walking around them, writing on the smart board, and then turning in real time to judge the expressions on their faces. Or if you needed a specialised skill set that wasn't in the room or perhaps didn't even work for your company, you, you wouldn't have to hire someone. You could potentially pay for the relevant expert in New York or Nairobi or Nairn to join your meeting for an hour in the same virtual room and very quick turnaround time. With 23% of current working hours predicted to shift from human to machine by 2025, there's going to be a real need for a strategic focus on reimagining the role of machines and your talent strategy. Automation is going to be key. It's not going to be optional as part of that strategy. You're probably sitting at home just now. Many of you might have a Google Home device or an Alexa device close by that, that you could um, ask to do something for you right now. But this technology, again, isn't widely used in the office. Imagine the future. Um, buildings which are part of an internet of things connected together and providing leading edge collaboration environments and optimised working conditions for you and your employees. So we've just gone very quickly through those topics, um, but speaking of buildings, I'm going to hand you over to Sarah, who is going to chat a little bit more about the physical space. Thanks, Chris. So as I said at the start, we won't spend too much time on this, but I will touch on it because it is important. Um, so physical space is more about the office space and thinking about facilities, but there's also an immediate need to ensure the site is ready uh, to safely operate and to assist with that return to work. Um, we've seen a lot in the news and top execs recently announcing, you know, the fact that traditional multi-storey buildings in Canary Wharf may not be needed anymore. We saw Jess Staley, um, the chief executive of Barclays, said that large headquarter buildings may become a thing of the past now. So it, it is about the physical space, and that's something that needs to be considered. But we also need to think about things like communication strategy. Um, how is the, the company's communication strategy set up in a post-COVID-19 world? How do we measure the creation of holistic return to work success metrics is important? And reworking the office space is important too, updating it for COVID-related health concerns, thinking about signage and layout, et cetera. And obviously, the phased employee return plan is important, maybe segregating by role type and collaboration level required. In terms of physical space adjustments um, on the next slide, when reintegration does happen, um, there will be adjustments, as I said, to the, phys to the existing space but also redesigning it in a way that is safe and comfortable for all. Uh, for example, at Capco, we're introducing a desk booking system, so people are guaranteed a desk before they come into work. This, and um, you know, having the right amount of social distancing and hand sanitation stations in place, so people can actually feel comfortable knowing that they can come into office and have a safe desk that is two metres from anyone else. Formalizing the hybrid model based on team profiling is very important. You know, people have gone from 100% working in the office to 100% working at home. So now we need to get the balance right in terms of, you know, maybe two days working from home and team rotation, etc. 
And finally, it's about transforming that employee behaviour, which interlocks with ways of working very, very clearly. The final one is around reimagined strategy. Though commercialised, there's an opportunity to utilise your footprint and create hubs with ecosystem partners. Location strategy, as I said, is very important. Reviewing of global footprint and scale of operations to assess specific onshore offshore requirements. Um, the head of Standard Chartered, um, sorry, the head of HR at Standard Chartered recently said that getting rid of these physical barriers between cities will actually make things way more diverse going forward. So we need to look at the talent pool. Organisations that enable wide-scale wide remote working will be tapping into their bigger talent pool on a global basis more than ever. Joining and leaving the organisation for geographical reasons will no longer be an issue. ESG impact is huge, though so positive impact to environmental, to social and governance factors. To, fin to finish up, a new model is needed to ensure that retained offices and home working is set up in a way that's resilient to future crisis. You know, things like a future pandemic or a cyber attack. Over to you, Chris, for wrap up. I hope you've um, got something from the topics that we've covered today. We, we've touched on a number of themes. We've looked at people. We've looked at ways of working, technology, and, and finally their physical space. And what you've probably noticed that there are recurring themes throughout them. You know, technology comes up a few times. Apart from its own section, we speak about the need to focus on your employees' well-being, the opportunities there are to employ people from different locations. So all of these things are connected, but at the same time, they can be addressed on their own. You might have your own priorities in your own organisation, and you can't solve all of your challenges at once. So CAPCO recommend a modular approach. Essentially, we put together a toolkit that can be applied to priorities of your organisation, and there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. But there are approaches that can be effectively tailored to address the deal issues. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but you know, for example, um, ways of working acceleration to start to address and, and reap some of the benefits that Sarah spoke about. Um, we can assess the technology assessment of your organisation and implement new tools. Um, we can look at that employee value proposition. So these are all areas that we can focus on, um, and we can do that in, in a way that is kind of phased. You know, essentially, we will be um, creating a, an approach that will be implementable. We will look at your immediate needs, we will put together a business case with you, and, and then we can look at implementing that. Now, I'm keen that we, we kind of leave some time at the end for questions and answers, but I'm, I'm, from a capital perspective, we'd be more than happy to come back and, and uh, collaborate again with the SIO and go into some of these topics in a bit more detail, because I know it is really important to all of our organisations that, that we work together in, in this time of crisis and, 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 and really kind of change financial services for the better in Scotland. So I think this is probably a, a good point. Maybe we have roughly about seven or eight minutes left, and perhaps we can look at some questions and answers. Yep. Um, so I see a few questions have come through. Thanks, thanks to those that have submitted. Um, so the first one here is around employee choice. So you, it says you mentioned employee choice in regards to ways of working. Um, could you expand on this? So um, I'll take this one. So yes, I think employee choice will be crucial to the way that we move forward. Looking at some of, I guess, the big tech giants recently in the news, the CEO of employees that they could keep working from home indefinitely, even after lockdown ends. I think Facebook said something similar, that they're happy for people to keep working from home after the pandemic. So these are all big and bold statements from big from two big organizations that used to really thrive on their collaborative physical office space. So it's great to see, you know, this sort of courageous move from, from execs, but that also will scare people. What about the people that really struggle with working from home? Many like it, but a lot don't like it. Those that struggle and have difficult home situations, you know, people may have sick or elderly family members, they may have childcare issues, and some people are really just craving to be back in the office and are missing that personal interaction. Some people live alone and are, are very lonely. Then we have the other end of the spectrum, um, those who have really enjoyed it and thrived from working from home. It's now going to be difficult to get them into the office. They'll be asking employers, why should I come back into the office when you know I've been so productive and I've been able to do my job no problem for the past few months? 
So this is why I say it's down to employee choice going forward, and it shows more than ever the need to get the employee value proposition right. Um, yeah, no, no, thank, th thank you, Sarah. Some really good points that you made there, and I think it, it, it closely relates to a couple of other questions that we've had come through. So, what is your view on how soon everyone will be able to return to the office as normal? Um, I don't think it's going to be this year. Um, you know, from speaking to our, our clients, we, we've uh, the impression we have is only between 20 and 50 percent of buildings will return. To, you know, to, to sorry, buildings will only return to between 20 and 50 percent capacity in, in 2020, and, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, we, we recently looked at some of the offices in Canada Square in London, where you've got these kind of high-rise skyscrapers, and the actual physical challenge of, of getting from the lobby into a lift whilst maintaining social distancing and then getting to your floor is, is really really quite a challenge. Um, and then when you get to your office space, you've got to potentially socially distance from someone else. So there's going to be fewer chairs. Um, you're going to have to wear a mask, so meetings are going to be more difficult. So in 2020, um, I don't think we should expect it to be anything like it was at the start of the year. As we move into 2021, um, and we see that hopefully the virus is more under control and that threat of a second wave has subsided, then it will be more about some of the topics that we've discussed in, in this call today around how you plan for that next phase and, and how you reorganise your business to, to make the most of the opportunities. But it is a, it is a very kind of um, challenging time for all of us, and I don't think we really know all the answers. The important thing is that we keep on top of the opportunities and we make sure that we are evolving our business to take advantage of those opportunities. What other questions do we have? Um, I one here about, one. Sorry, oh, Sarah Kenna. I was just going to say, there's one here I see on um, what recommendations do you have for leaders, as I guess okay. as we prepare for this. Um, so, I think the next phase of the transition will be vital to ensuring the success and navigation of the organisation, the team and, and individuals. So, leaders really need to have the right tools and insights to help them be effective. I think a crisis really alters the way people process information. So leaders, leaders need to get the balance right, and they need to be more dynamic. They need to be inspirational yet comforting, and continue to push on performance as they always did. So I think being more mindful of people's fears and insecurities um, at a time of rapid change is really key. I think it requires a new kind of leader, um, leaders that can be courageous and honest. Um, I think the power of vulnerability and taking risks is important. Um, being able to have those uncomfortable and challenging conversations with employees and really having care is the most important thing. Um, something that was quite interesting that, that cropped up the other day, and I think I've seen a question on the chat here that's similar, is um, you know, leaders need to be really aware of their surroundings and you know, think about other people's situations. Um, for example, video conferencing really gives you insight into other people's lives. Um, I think leaders need to have an awareness on, you know, how that comes across on camera. Think about their employees that may live in small box rooms. They may not have a desk. They may not have the right setup, and they may need to even like sit on their bed to work versus their boss who has luxurious surroundings. Um, so I think that's something that we really need to be mindful and having that self awareness as a leader. So you can tweak your style is really important. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point, Sarah, and it, and it ties into a couple of other questions. If I had this one from from Stephen Fairley, it says diversity and inclusion is very important at the moment. If working from home is the way forward, how can businesses ensure employees and future employees have the same experience, particularly people who do not have an office or live with many people working at the same time? And I just wanted to kind of read another question as well. We kind of tackle both of them together. As a new employee entering to a company during this time from working from home, what sources and things should an employee think about more about initially for the long run and as they adjust, e.g. reflection, planning, etc.? So Sarah made a very good point there about people's home circumstances are very different. You, you know, I'm sure you deal with colleagues all the time who are kind of working in the kitchen all, alongside their partner, or they're kind of like having to struggle with childcare and, and you know, people are walking past in the background when they're on VC calls and, and that's not ideal. And we certainly shouldn't assume that it's going to be a case of right, let's flick a switch, everyone works from home and everyone has that capability. So that's why a, a blended approach, you know, finding out what's right for your team 
listening to people is vital, understanding what the needs are, and then shaping your organisation so that all of your employees get an experience that works well from them. The key word here is going to be flexibility. You know, flexibility and who can work from home, who can come into the office, when it's necessary to come into the office, and, and when people can really choose themselves. It's going to be very important. And it is a very difficult time for people joining a new organisation. I was on a, a call on Monday there where I was um, introducing Capco in Scotland to some people who just joined the company. And you know, it might sound a little bit silly, but I hadn't really appreciated until I joined the call that everyone was joining Capco from the comforts of their own home. They weren't getting to meet their colleagues. They weren't in a room um, going through presentations. And that's a very strange experience for anyone. As an employer, we need to make sure that we are um, giving people the support that they need. But as an employee, I think the important thing is to look at all the things that you would do normally when you're in a role and make a conscious effort to repeat those things. But in that virtual environment, you have to reach out to stakeholders. You have to make time to put time in people's diaries and, and get to know them. One of the things I've actually found virtually is that because of the peculiar circumstances of COVID, it's often easier to, to break the ice with someone for the first time. You're all in a similar boat. You have a lot more in common than perhaps that you did before. So sometimes the first couple of minutes of the conversation can be quite straightforward. And that in itself then, then, then leads you to begin to build that relationship. So, yep, things are challenging um, and things are not going to get easier soon. But we really all have to look at the tools that are available and look how we can adapt. And, and just to finally go back to that diversity and inclusion point. Um, we, we looked at earlier how things like um, gender balance could be addressed um, um, by the fact that the working can be more flexible. There are also particular types of personality that are perhaps better suited to home, people who just don't like having to speak to people all of the time. And, and I'm sure many of you are like that. And I'm a little bit like that myself. But So this new kind of flexible working and ways of working, it, it really opens up the talent pool that is available to organisations. And, and if we think about it carefully and we structure our businesses appropriately, then we really can take advantage of, of that and, and get ahead of our competitors. So I know we're kind of running Thanks. out of time a little bit. Um, yeah, I think um, there are quite a few more questions, which is great mm -hmm. to see. But, um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So um, we will do our best to answer the rest of the questions. We'll work with the SIO on that. Um, but thank you for listening, everyone, and thanks for your attendance. Um, I'll hand back over to Leah now to, to close. And thank you, Leah and SIO, for having us. That's great. No, thank you. This has been fantastic. Good. Um, several points for us all to consider. Very valid. Um, I actually have a neighbour across the road who has a desk from her work, but she can't fit it anywhere. <laughs> so it's uh, you know, great to have a... <laughs> um, So no, I, I think from the questions and from the follow-up, we'll certainly build up on perhaps another couple of sessions. I have noted here that some of the kind of hot topics perhaps might be around um, diversity and inclusion, um, around the gender. In, in issues and the, the situation that we have at home, or we might have a desk, but we don't know where to fit it. Um, the leadership one, I think, is a, is a good one that perhaps we might all want to follow up on, um, and perhaps even new employees and how to onboard them and make sure that they are up to speed with the you know, ways of working and the organizational culture as well, without having their colleagues around them. So. Once again, I would like to thank everyone for your time and for attending. Um, it's been very insightful. Um, and I hope to keep in touch and have follow-up sessions.